Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packer and welcome to Scripture and Tradition. Today we will continue looking at the Sermon on the Mount and Christ's demand for perfection. Uh, we're using my book, Saved, a Bible Study Guide for Catholics, as a supplemental guide. And if you're following along with us in the book, we're beginning today on page 122. Now you can get that book at EWTN's Religious Catalog. Just go to EWTNRC.com. And the book is item T1784. T1784. Now, if you have a question or a comment for the show, let us know. You can email us. You can go online to our Facebook or YouTube pages, or you can call us at 1-800-221-9460. If that's if you're in North America, that's 1-800-221-9460. If you are outside North America, you can call country code 1, Area code 205-271-2989. And we'd love to hear from you. If you call from outside North America, we'll put you right at the front of the line. All right. So let's, let's get started here. Um, we have been talking about the Sermon on the Mount, the early part, we talked about the role of righteousness in um, the Beatitudes, and uh, now I'd like to go to another section. This is something of a transition from the Beatitudes to the moral commands that Christ gives. You'll, as a matter of fact, after this, you'll continually hear how he says, you have heard that it was said, thou shalt not kill. But I say, you know, and he'll, so take a commandment and then he'll give his explanation of it, which is always a going to more of the internal, you know, uh, in, well, internalization would be a good way to put it, internalization of the commandments. So you don't just do the outside, but you also go to the depths of your heart. The law says, thou shalt not commit adultery. I say, don't even look at a woman with lust, okay? and so on. So here we um, are dealing with the preparation for that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20 where he says, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, something to keep in mind, a lot of people misconstrue this. The Pharisees were a movement of lay people. This was not the priest. The priest mostly, not exclusively, but mostly belonged to the Sadducee party, which is, you know, we say Sadducee, but it was this Zadokim, named after a high priest named Zadok, who lived back in the 190s BC. And so the Sadducees were the priests and the nobility, while the Pharisees were lay people. And they were trying to bring reform because a lot of the priests were trying to go along with the Greek government and culture. So when the Greeks conquered the Holy Land, they acted like them. When the Romans conquered it, uh, so, uh, 120 years later or so, they went along with the Romans. And they had a little bit more openness to some of the things the pagans were doing. So the, and the Pharisees were really upset. 
justifiably. The Sadducees were, had a gymnasium. That was one of the things that really got people upset. They went to the gym. Why? Because the gymnasium, uh, gymnasion in Greek, comes from the adjective gymnos, meaning to be naked. So they would have their sports without any clothes on. Jews objected to this. This was something offensive. And Greeks couldn't wait to get their clothes off. But the Jews didn't like it, especially male nudity. They found that more offensive, even. Uh, all, any nudity was bad enough. And some of them even would have an operation to make it look as if they were not circumcised so that if they competed in the games in Greece, they would look like everybody else who's also naked. So this got the Pharisees going. Pharisee means the separated ones, perushtim in Hebrew. And they were separated from them. They, their goal was in the face of the priests and high priests failing to live out the law of God, the Pharisees would then say, well, if you won't, we lay people will. See? That was their mentality. And um, the, the problem is they developed their own tradition of interpretation based on a principle called putting a fence around the law. In other words, the law says you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Pharisees said, therefore, to make sure you don't do it by accident, don't say the name of the Lord at all. And you could be executed if you took God's name in vain. If you said God's name, only the high priest was allowed to say it. On one day of the year, six times in the liturgy of the Feast of Yom Kippur, otherwise not allowed to say it. And yet not even the other priests could say the name. So this, this kind of uh, strictness was part of it, and that's the background, in part, for who Pharisees were. And <clears throat> you, you, you see that the disciples of Jesus Christ must have a righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. He wanted to go beyond their rules. So, for instance, the Bible has a law. You shall not cook a kid goat in its mother's milk. Right? So they said to make sure you don't do that, even by accident, you cannot have meat and milk products at the same meal. And you had to have a separate set of plates and pots and uh, sinks for washing, just in case a little bit of milk or meat gets caught in a crack in the plate or something, and that they might mix. So it became that kind of strictness. Christ is going to be critical of those traditions. And when he speaks against the traditions, he's talking about the Pharisee traditions. That's what he's speaking against, the Pirkei Avot. And uh, that, that's going to be a, a source of difficulty. Um, and this is very important. The scribes, by the way, were the scholars within the Pharisee party. So these were the experts. That's what a scribe was. They, they knew how to read and write. Um, and so that was a very important thing. And you, you see, uh, for instance, St. Paul, when he's on trial, one of the times he's on trial, a lot of them, uh, but he said in Acts 26, verse 5, I have belonged to the strictest sect of our religion, and I lived as a Pharisee. He, in fact, he was taught 
by one of the greatest of the Pharisees, Gamaliel. There's a line, in, I think it's in the Mishnah, it might be in Talmud, that says when Gamaliel died, righteousness died with him. So he was just one of the high points of um, uh, uh, Jewish living and uh, a great teacher. And he, we see him in Acts, by the way. We see him mentioned there. Um, and St. Uh, Paul studied under him. And so uh, this is something that Christ insists is still not a high enough norm. He wants something more. Now, what is it? What is it? What is that more that he wants? Well, that's what I was saying. He goes on from Matthew 5, verse 21, all the way through verse 48. And he gives a series of statements about the commandments. Takes them from the Ten Commandments in um, Matthew 21. Uh, Jeff, in Matthew 5, verse 21, sorry, Matthew 5, 21. You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment, and if you insult a brother or sister, you'll be liable to the council, and if you say you fool, you'll be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister is something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you'll be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Now, the Ten Commandments say you shall not murder. And the word that's used there, by the way, in the commandment, uh, al uh, the, the, now, the verb ratzach means to kill by stealth or murder. It's not killing. Some people... <laughs> have said to me, well, you, I mean, you shouldn't eat meat because you, you, thou shalt not kill. You can't kill animals. Mm, wrong answer. Uh, they have a completely different word for slaughtering animals. That's zavach, zavach. And ratzach the, is, is not the same word. It doesn't have the same meaning. And they even have a different verb for that you use when you kill somebody to execute them. So that's not forbidden by the commandment. And there's a different verb for uh, killing somebody in war. You know, so they'll, they'll use hemit, uh, which means to cause someone to be dead. Well, that's executing you. You know, you cause them to be dead. Uh, or for killing in war and stuff, that would be harag, harag. So they, they, they have different nuances, but the word in the commandment specifically refers to murder of human beings. That's what's forbidden. And Christ wants us to go beyond that, not even holding grudges, not even being angry, not using names. And one of the names that they use here um, is a, a very serious insult uh, that you, if you uh, call somebody this kind of fool, it can start a blood feud that lasts for generations. In the Middle East, they take insults very seriously. You don't play games with insults. Um, you mean what you say. And you, you see, uh, related to that in uh, Matthew 5, verse 27, You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. 
And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. And then, of course, in Matthew 5, verse 8, we see the beatitude. Blessed are those who are pure in heart, for they shall see God. So that this sexual purity and it is more than just avoiding the action of adultery. It includes the uh, looking at somebody with lust. And that that's enough to get somebody to hell. You, uh, you can't bring lustful thoughts to heaven. They're not going to fit. You have to bring that respect for the dignity of people, of everybody. And this is, you know, this is one of the reasons that the pornography plague that has hit our country is so serious. That Christ, it's not, you know, my idea or the Pope doesn't like it. No, this industry is hellish. And, and it's enough to bring people to hell. And it's amazing to me how, you know, I'll see uh, people casually joke on television shows about pornography as if it's no big deal, forgetting that they are looking at people that they have no right to see. There is a dignity that is inherent in people and if you don't have a right to be with that person in that kind of vulnerability, that's one of the elements of being naked. There's a vulnerability at that point. And you have to earn the right to be able to be there with somebody, presumably your spouse. And this is um, a, a very serious issue that you don't... And, our culture just doesn't take it seriously enough. And it should, especially when you consider that when they find out about serial murderers, this is not mass murderers, but serial murderers, typically have a lot of pornography back at their house after they get caught, you find it. That they're, to try and say, especially if you're in the industry or the so-called entertainment industry, and you say, oh, no, this doesn't do anybody harm. Oh, well, yeah? Ask the women and children, sometimes men, but mostly women and children, who are in the human trafficking trade. That they're, they're slaves, and they're forced to do this pornography. They are drugged and enslaved to do this. I you know, I've, you know, know people who were sold by their fathers when they were four years old into prostitution. Four years old. And then into the, the, the pornography. Of course it has big effects. And we can't neglect that. And doing these sins, like anger and lust, is enough for somebody to lose their salvation. Christ isn't saying this to outsiders. He's speaking to his disciples. And that's why this applies within the church. The idea that you can be saved and then you don't have to worry about committing these sins is a false understanding. All right, we've got to take a break. We'll be back in just a minute, um, and we'll come back and continue on with the Sermon on the Mount.
All right. Um, let's take a look at another one of the Lord's commandments, and that's in Matthew chapter 5, verse 31 and 32, where he says, It was also said, and this is from the book of Deuteronomy, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of unchastity causes her to commit adultery, and whoever divorces, marries a divorced woman commits adultery. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for unchastity and marries another commits adultery. That's pretty serious, especially when you see uh, two phenomena. Uh, in 1965, no-fault divorce was put into law in this country. And the divorce rate went up. And along with it, very quickly, increased poverty for women and their children. Now, on one hand, you had a lot of feminists who were supporting this, that you know, a woman should be free to, to leave. But it became more advantageous financially, anyway, to the men if they left, and it became um, a, a problem for women and their children. And a good deal of the poverty among women and children increased as a result. Secondly, we've seen a second trend that started in the, uh, also in the 60s, began to increase. Uh, when I was born in the 1940s, the rate of out-of-wedlock birth was 4%. Today, it is up to 52%. That's not even uh, getting a, div a divorce. I, it acts the same way, leaving women and children you know, in greater risk of poverty especially the children, they, they suffered even more than the women, um, they, and less likelihood, very low likelihood of them finishing high school, high likelihood they'll be out of wedlock, parents themselves. So that these two elements are forbidden by that. Our Lord wants men and women to make a commitment to each other that is lifelong. Why? You may think that your kids will be better off. This is one of the things a lot of people say. Well, if I get a divorce and I'm happy, my kids will be happy too. It'll be better for them. Who do you think you're kidding? You didn't ask the kid. I, I, we had a couple on one of my uh, Wednesday night EWTN live programs who had said exactly that to each other until they saw their two children huddled in a corner, crying their eyes out that their parents were splitting. They didn't know what was happening to them. And it is not better. I, again, there, there, are, there are exceptions. When one of the people is violent or is bringing drugs and other, that's a different situation, to be sure. But if it's a matter, well, I'm, I'm in love with somebody else, and I'll be, if I'm happy, my kids will be happy. No. You don't care about them. You care about your happiness. Oh, how can you say that? Well, I watch what happens as the kids are uh, left abandoned. And what's the issue? Kids are not like puppies. You can house train a puppy in a few weeks. And they stop tearing stuff up around the house after a year or so, depending on the breed. But kids are not done until you're gone. I mean, even if they leave the house and live on their own, most of them keep coming back. And they bring other ones with them. Spouses and children of their own. And that your role in family is a lifetime role because these people are part of a set of relationships and not a job. It's part of a vocation, not a task. And Christ wants us to take that seriously. And 
something that is related to it is in the very next section, verses 33 to 37. Again, you've heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. They didn't have much dye in those days. And the Greeks and Romans did, but apparently not in Israel. And let your word be yes uh, 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 or no. Yes, yes or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. In other words, you give your word. There's that great line, if you've ever seen, and if you haven't, you ought to, see the wonderful movie, A Man for All Seasons, about St. Thomas More. And he's got a line when his friend says to him, oh, Thomas, for fellowship, just swear the oath, even though you don't believe it. Swear the oath of loyalty to the king. And Thomas says uh, to his friend, Norfolk, when a man gives his word and swears an oath, he holds his, his soul in his hands. And when he breaks that oath, it's like water that seeps through between his fingers. Our word is something that we should give. <laughs> There's a message to take to a lot of people running for office. But it's, you know, you don't swear false oaths at all. Just don't swear, tell the truth. That's what, and mean what you say when you make a commitment. Very basic, but not, today a lot of the people are not getting married because I'm convinced they're afraid to fail, to avoid failure, they don't even try. This is a common problem. And then we see the next section is very well known, Matthew 5, 38 to 47. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer, but if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. If anyone force you to go one mile, Roman soldiers could do that. They could force somebody to carry their baggage for one mile. Then go, uh, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you. Do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For it makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not Gentiles do the same. A series of instructions that requires us as Christians to have that kind of forgiveness. It's not, well, if you feel like it. No, we don't get that option and that we will be judged by this. This is his um, commandment. And uh, the, the idea where you, uh, you, you've you heard that it was said, love your friends and hate your enemies. Hate your enemies is not found in the Bible. Hate your enemies is not found in any of the rabbinic literature. None of the Pharisee writings say that. Where do we find it? Among the Essenes. The Essenes who lived at the Dead Sea, at Qumran, they had that in their rule book that you should hate your enemy. And on one hand, they were a very strict group trying to reform both the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That was their goal. They didn't think the Sadducees or Pharisees were holy enough. But by having that principle, they ensured their own end. You can't call people to hate your enemies. After a certain point, you run out of people to stop hating. Everybody can tick you off at some point. 
And I said, well, I hate him too. I hate him too. Um, you just can't keep And so they died out. Finally, he concludes this whole sermon, the, the section of the sermon, the moral section, in verse chapter 5, verse 48 of Matthew. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. I've, you've heard me say lots of, t dozens of times how people tell me I don't need to go to confession. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't robbed money and all this. Um, and I always respond, you know, well, you do sound very good. So long as you keep on comparing yourself to Al Capone and make yourself look good. But the problem is Al Capone is not the norm by which you judge yourself. God the Father is. And now how do you stack up, you know, with the perfection of God the Father? And this sets up for us a goal that we need to keep working at and uh, the goal that Christ has for us so that it is very much part of what Jesus meant when he preached, repent and believe, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand repenting of failing against his teachings and believing his words are key. That's why at the end of the sermon he'll say, anyone who hears my words and does not do them has built a house on sand. And I know a place that they did that. We, uh, in fact, uh, there was a house that Jesuits owned. They had bought and it was built on the old beach. After the Chicago fire, they extended the lake front out quite a few hundred yards into the lake. They took the uh, buildings that had burned down, they put all the rubble in the water, and then they put a park over it, which is nice, Lincoln Park, Grant Park. But then the, the beach was inland, and they built this, this six flat, on the, what used to be the beach. Well, when they were doing some work next door and driving some pylons into the, the dirt for another building, the sand got shaken and the house collapsed. So that's not something made up that our Lord just saying. You build on sand, your house is going to collapse. Unless, of course, you live in a tent with the Bedouins. Then you'd be all right. But uh, if you're going to have a a house made out of stone or brick, don't build it on sand. Whereas if you hear his words and do them, you've built on rock. That's what's key here. All right, let's go to some questions we have from our studio audience. Let's start off with this lady here. Ma'am, where are you from? Um, I came from um, Eccleston, St. Helens, England. Oh, in England? Mm -hmm. Well, I think you might get the long distance award. Good to have you here. Thank you. So what is, uh, welcome to this Birmingham. Uh, you have another Birmingham back in England, yes. we, which we named after in Leeds and a bunch of other towns. So what can we do for you today? Um, Father, I was uh, curious uh, when we were discussing earlier today about um, preparing a young kid for the meal and um, was forbidden to boil it in its mother's milk. Right. And the Coralie perhaps uh, with the kosher not mixing or having milk or dairy mm -hmm. with their meat and the plates. And what part of the ancient tradition is that derivative, was that from? Okay. And how does it carry over into present day? Why do they still do that? Okay, so the law is found in, Deuter in uh, Exodus twice and in Deuteronomy. It might be in Leviticus too. But it says, don't cook a kid in its mother's milk. That's repeated at least three times that I can remember off the top of my head. And that's when to make sure, and why would, why would anybody want to cook a kid goat in its mother's milk? Well, but, but why goats? That's the key. I happen to have done a section of my doctoral dissertation on that law. And I looked up, I don't think any of my other colleagues did this, but I went to an Arab 
cookbook. Laban Immo, the milk of his mother, is the name of a recipe. The reason they use goat's milk is it doesn't curdle when you cook it. If you've ever tried to make beef stroganoff, first time I ever made it, it I, I had it on too high of a heat, and the, the, the sour cream from cow's milk curdled. And in goat's milk, it doesn't curdle. That's why they use it. But apparently, the, there, there are a number of theories about uh, the law, but the law may be something of empathy. I mean, all right, you're going to eat the kid goat. I understand that, but leave his mother out of it. Don't milk her and then kill, you know, cook it and uh, her milk. Um, uh, you know, it might have been that kind of uh, feeling. But then, as time went on, they had this sense of uh, law that uh, was, you know, uh, you had to keep it all the time. And you had to make sure there was no meat and milk mixed together. And that's where the, the continued law developed. And it's especially uh, an area of Jewish law that women are in charge of. That's sort of their domain. You know, the, 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 they know the law and they are in charge of the house and making sure this is kept. So, all right, we have a caller. Hello, Neil. Uh, uh, good, uh, good afternoon, Father Mitch. Hi, uh, where are you call calling from? Uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Great, welcome. Uh, thank you very much for taking my call. May God continue to bless you with all the wonderful teaching you're giving us. Uh, my question is, um, with 69% of Catholics recently surveyed are not believing in a real presence, is it a mortal sin when they're going to the Mass and receiving communion, and how will they be saved? Yeah. Uh, if they uh, if they believe don't believe in a real presence, I mean, is that a, sure. really a mortal sin? And um, um, how 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 they how can they be saved if they don't believe in a Catholic teaching? Okay, Neil, there are a couple things you have to keep in mind. A lot, I'd say, from my experience, the majority of those people who don't believe in the real presence don't know that that is what we believe. They don't know the Catholic doctrine. Sadly for them, much of Catholic doctrine has not been taught to them over the last 50 years. And as a result, they don't even know what they're supposed to believe. So those folks who simply are, don't know are not committing a mortal sin. Now, now they need to learn more about it. Uh, in fact, when we finish going through this book, the next book we're going to deal with, uh, because of that survey, is the, uh, the Bible study I wrote on the Eucharist. Okay? I'm going to go through that next. But then there's one other group for whom th what you're saying applies very much. If somebody knows, well, the Catholics believe that that really is the body of Christ. I don't believe that, but I'll receive anyway because I, I like going to Mass, I like the music. If they know what the doctrine is, and they reject it, and then receive communion for some other reason, that would be a serious sin, because they are knowingly culpable. They know better, and they do what's wrong. They go against their own conscience. If you don't believe what we believe, you ought not to receive our Eucharist. And I'm sure you were raised a Catholic, but if you reject that faith, you ought not receive until you come back to believing what's there. This is a matter of not answering to me. I don't know what the people believe as they come up to a Holy Communion line. I can't possibly know what everybody thinks, but Christ does, and he will be the one to judge their consciences. But for the ones who just don't know any better, and they probably, you know, what is oftentimes the case, I believe what the Catholic Church believes, but they can't put it into words because they weren't 
well catechized. They didn't learn the doctrines in various classes going up. So they're not culpable, and they probably would have enough faith to say, well, I believe what the church believes, whatever that is. Um, and they need to study more and understand better what Scripture teaches, and that's what we're going to do then. And we all have to be involved in helping to include people, but uh, they're not culpable like those who know what the church's teaching is, reject it, and then approach communion anyway. That's where there's moral culpability. All right, I got to take a break. We'll be back in just a minute, so please stay with us. We'll get more questions and comments. We are ready to uh, take another question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Hi, I'm from Artesia, New Mexico. Great, good to have you uh, here. That's down near I-10, right? Uh, quite a ways from it. Oh, is it? I-10 is close to El Paso. Oh, okay. All right, so you're yeah. north of there? North. All right. And so your question? Uh, Father, I always wondered when uh, the... Uh, Catholic Christians started making the sign of the cross. Mm -hmm. We see the first reference to making the sign of the cross in the writings of Tertullian in the late 100s, early uh, 200s. He, he mentions it. So, and he doesn't say that this is something we're going to start now. He's, he's explaining what Christians had already been doing for a long time. And he was just telling people that we always begin our prayer with the sign of the cross. So it was something that was already taken for granted by the second century. We don't know when precisely it began, but it was just normal uh, in this, uh, by the, the second century. Okay, is that your only question? No, I have another one. Yes. Um, uh, our separated brethren say hallelujah, while well, we Catholics say hallelujah. Uh -huh. Even the uh, Spanish-speaking separated brethren, they put a J in front of it to say hallelujah. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, does that have a history? Yes, it does have a history. Do you want to know it? Yes. Okay. It's very simple. The, the, the word hallelujah is a verb with a uh, suffix added. So the verb is halalu, and it comes from the verb form halal, halal. Halal has a number of meanings to it, but one of them is to praise. And halalu means y'all praise, as we would say here in Alabama. It's the uh, second person plural imperative uh, uh, form of the verb halal. And ya at the end is from God's name, so it's praise the Lord. And the Hebrew form of it is hallelujah. But in Greek, there is no letter H. The closest they can get to that is a rough breathing mark. There's what looks something like uh, uh, an apostrophe. You put it at the start of a, a word that begins with a vowel, and it becomes ha. But they don't have the letter H. Hebrew has uh, three forms of that sound. One is ha, and another one is ha, and then cha. And Actually, Jews don't distinguish 
the the from cha. They, they they just call them both cha. Uh, Arabs make that distinction. You know, and it, it's different letters, and the, the uh, Hebrew should be di different. I think the Jewish people from Arab-speaking countries do make the distinction, but most uh, Jewish people don't. Um, but it's, it's uh, that's, well, and now I'm getting, see, I taught Hebrew for a long time. I get into the technicalities, but it, the hallelu, it's, it's just like our age, hallelu. Uh, and it, uh, but when the Greeks didn't have that letter and then it got transliterated into Latin, it became alalu because they didn't have it either. You know, they didn't see it in the Greek, so they didn't get it, okay? But it was just that simple, just going from one, from a Semitic language with sounds that are not present in some of the Indo-European languages like Greek. That's all. All right, we have another caller. Hello, Celia? Yes, Father. Hi, where are you calling from? From Broward County, Florida. Great, great. And your question? Why did God the Father will Jesus to be crucified? Okay. Now, ma'am, um, do you know of anybody in your family or extended family who ever was sent off to war? Mm, no. No? Okay. Well, my dad had served in World War II, and you know, most of the men in my neighborhood had served in World War II. And there, there are a lot of folks that I'm, I know who did. And what they did was a tremendous thing, you know, uh, to prevent the spread of the Nazi empire was extremely important. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. Now, the generals sent uh, almost 200,000 men to land at Normandy. And they knew that there were going to be high casualties. They knew that they were, you know, that the gun emplacements were going to take out a lot. And that's why they sent so many. Now, should they have sacrificed those men? I don't know, Father. Well, Hold on. Hold uh, well on. Here's, here's, think about this then. Don't, don't change it to something else. You have to think about that. Is it, um, you know, something where, you know, if they had not gone on and uh, invaded Western Europe, we would be stuck with a Nazi regime that, would, kill, would have killed more Jews, would have killed the Slavic people after they enslaved them for a number of years, and wanted to conquer uh, England and, if they could, the United States. Would that have been a good thing? No. Of course not. Of course not. And the men who went and the generals who sent them and their parents who sent them to the army knew that the risk was very great, but the cause was worthwhile. And that is one of the things that people have done, as horrible as it is, it's what people have done to prevent something as evil as Nazism from taking over. And the sacrifice, including the guys who went in there, a lot of them knowing, just may not make it. A lot of them made their wills out before they went onto the ships at uh, D-Day, uh, before D-Day, and before they got into the gliders and the airplanes. They made out their wills because they had no idea that they were going to survive, but they knew that if they did this, that eventually they would have stopped the Nazis, and they did. It's something parallel. You see how Christ 
initiates his coming with a, uh, with a message. The kingdom of God is at hand. He said that after he had engaged Satan in the temptations. And even when Satan says, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms. Notice, Jesus did not dispute Satan's control of the kingdoms of the world. He didn't dispute it. But he goes on and he preaches the coming of the kingdom of God against that kingdom of Satan and darkness. And Christ knew that Satan was a liar, the father of lies, and a murderer. He says that in John chapter 8. So that he's going up against someone who is vicious in lies and willing to kill. But it is worth going up against that kingdom in order to redeem people from it. It was worthwhile. And that is why God the Father sent his Son to redeem us from the control of Satan and his kingdom. And this is, uh, and they thought we were worth it like the people who fought World War II was worth sending their sons into horrible battles. So that would be what I'd recommend you consider. Let's, we have just a minute to go. Let's talk to Joanne. Joanne, you there? Yes, Father, yes. as a quick question. Sure. You had mentioned no-fault divorce. I, unfortunately, was a victim of no-fault divorce, and I eventually applied for an annulment and was mm -hmm. granted it. And uh, a woman in my church said, well, I don't believe you're married, you're married forever. The church, I said, the church grants annulments. It's a formal process. Right. And later on, when I married someone who's not Christian, his marriage had to be examined, too. So sure. would you quickly say the church does allow annulments? It has That's to right. be a form. You have to follow a very... Uh, strict form, and would you well, elaborate let, on I, that? I have to jump in because I'm really running out of time. Let me just say this, that the church recognizes annulments for this reason, that some component that is necessary for marriage is, was actually missing. One of the elements, if one of the persons lied to this, I've dealt with this kind of case, where they said, uh, I don't want children, but they didn't tell the other spouse until after the marriage. I said, I refuse to become a parent. That's grounds, because you're not open to life. If you uh, are not committed to lifelong marriage, well, I'm going to try this out. I'll sort of kick the tires on this marriage. No, no, no. You go into it with, you know, commitment. And if one didn't, then the other one, you know, has grounds. So there are grounds for that kind of annulment, plus some others. That's where you check that out. But you can't do it now because I'm flat out of time. The Lord bless you all and keep you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And by the uh, prayers of St. John Paul II, whose feast is today, may keep us in the church together. And we ask you to keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill. And we'll pay our bills too because we've got lots. Thank you.